Hello everyone. Today we talk about um, ectopic pregnancy. Uh, it's a common condition, uh, a common gynecological emergency that uh, we see every day. It's estimated that uh, one in 40 pregnancies end up as uh, ectopic uh, pregnancy or like 25 in a thousand pregnancies end up as ectopic pregnancy. Um, if you come to our hospital, we have uh, the fact that we operate on one ectopic at least every day. So that that is quite, quite a common condition. That's a quite um, common gynecological emergency that we should know about. Uh, so let's let's go into it. So these are the objectives of uh, this presentation. Define ectopic pregnancy, give us the risk factors, the sites, the types, the important investigations that are needed and also the management of um, ectopic pregnancy. So we start with uh, definitions as usual. Um, so an ectopic pregnancy is also called um, an extrauterine pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is really an implantation of the uh, conceptus outside the endometrial uh, cavity. So if we have a pregnancy that has implanted itself outside the endometrial cavity in the uterus, uh, that would be an ectopic pregnancy. Extrauterine pregnancy is really a synonym uh, for a uh, for an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, when we say heterotopic pregnancy, what we mean is that we have both an intrauterine and an ectopic pregnancy at the same time. This is a rare occurrence. I think the uh, prevalence is about one in maybe 20 to 30,000 pregnancies. So this is quite a rare occurrence where a woman has both an intrauterine pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy as well. I've put this uh, definition for cornu uh, ectopic because it's a misnomer. Uh, I think a lot of us say cornu when what we mean is uh, interstitial pregnancy. So we need to know that when we say cornu ectopic, what we mean is that we have an ectopic pregnancy implanted in a rudimentary horn, uh, like you have a biconiate uh, uterus. And this uh, kind of biconiate uterus has a rudimentary horn, and then the pregnancy gets implanted in that in that horn uh, instead of the main cavity of the of the uterus that would be what we would be uh, we should be calling a cornu ectopic instead of uh, what we we say most of the time so how do we make a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy um, Commonly, patients who come with abdominal pain, severe abdominal pain, usually localized uh, to a side. Um, they will have maybe abdominal pain on the left side or on the right side. It might be associated with some vaginal bleeding and there's some um, history of um, amenorrhea, a woman having missed um, a period. So those are the, are the things that make us think about an ectopic pregnancy. Commonly in our setup, we see a young woman of reproductive age coming very pale and in shock. Uh, that is always an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. Many times all we have to do is um, do a pregnancy test and then we confirm um, uh, the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy. So that's how uh, we make a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy in our setup. Um, there are several risk factors that help us um, pick up the fact that this woman might have an ectopic history of uh, having pelvic inflammatory disease, a woman who has had um, a previous ectopic pregnancy because then she had uh, some tubal surgery on her, a woman who has had um, a tubal ligation and ends up pregnant. We always have to think about an ectopic pregnancy. A woman who's uh, having an IUC, an intrauterine contraceptive device, and then ends up becoming pregnant, is very likely uh, going to have an ectopic pregnancy. Um, we've already talked about previous ectopic. Um, uh, somebody who's having uh, contraception that is uh, progesterone-based might end up uh, with an ectopic pregnancy. This is because... Um, uh, Progesterones affect motility of smooth muscles. So if we have 
the progesterone uh, motility might be affected and we might end up with um, with an ectopic pregnancy. Assisted reproductive technologies um, are also a risk factor for ectopic. Uh, somebody who's had several multiple terminations might also uh, have a risk for ectopic. This is because um, multiple termination, because of the way terminations are done, uh, might end up with an infection and that might um, end up uh, predisposing a woman to uh, to an ectopic pregnancy. Um, so we get to uh, types of ectopic pregnancy. So ectopic pregnancies can be acute, um, as we described in the diagnosis, where a woman comes in in shock, uh, in severe abdominal pain with uh, pale vaginal bleeding. Uh, that would be an acute uh, kind of ectopic. A chronic uh, ectopic would be that ectopic where um, a woman had an, an ectopic previously and um, the body has found a way to stop the bleeding itself. So momentum has grown into the ectopic. Um, uh, some clots have been there and bleeding has been arrested. Bow has been attached to the, um, uh, to the place of bleeding. And when we open these patients, we just find that there's no bleeding. There's just an odd ectopic that that was there. Ectopics can also be uh, classified as ruptured and unruptured. Uh, I usually discourage um, this kind of classification uh, because when um, we are on the word and people say and uh, this is an unruptured ectopic, people would relax and and not treat this as an emergency. So a ruptured ectopic, unruptured ectopic is an emergency because you don't want to wait for a rupture to happen. So when you have an unruptured ectopic, it doesn't mean we relax now and do it tomorrow. It just means that this needs to be attended to as soon as possible so that we don't have a patient that ends up with um, with an abdomen full of blood. Uh, in our setup, unruptured ectopics are quite rare. Most of the patients we have uh, have ectopic pregnancies that are ruptured. They have a blood in the abdomen already, one liter, two liters, three liters, and so on. So the point here is that when we have an unruptured ectopic, we treat it with the same urgency as, as um, a ruptured ectopic and also that we avoid um, making this diagnosis because many of the times it's wrong because usually a patient comes with a problem. Uh, they come with a problem, abdominal pain, uh, then uh, people on the ward say this is an unruptured ectopic pregnancy because the vitals are normal. But this diagnosis should be kind of discouraged. Maybe for somebody who's come to the antenatal with no problems, then we find that the, the pregnancy is, is not in the uterus. Maybe in that situation. Otherwise, we need to be careful in making this diagnosis of an unruptured ectopic because we can put a woman's life in danger. Um, then we move on to sites of ectopic pregnancy. So we have several sites of ectopic pregnancy. So the general classification for type of the sites of ectopic pregnancy are that they can be tubal or they can be uh, non-tubal ectopic pregnancies. So tubal ectopic pregnancies account for over 95 to 98% of ectopic pregnancies. So if we have the anatomy of the tube uh, in order, so we can say um, ectopic uh, in the tube can be interstitial, uh, meaning is that, that it's in the area where there's uh, the part of the tube where there's muscle, it can be ismic, it can be ampullary, and it can be um, uh, fimbrio. Uh, the important thing to remember here is that most ectopics are in the ampulla and the reason most ectopics are in the ampulla is because that's where fertilization uh, takes place and if there's impairment of movement of the um, egg in the tube then the egg stays there or the fertilized egg stays there and starts to implant in there. So that is um, what is um, what is uh, common. Uh, the other point which, I, which has already been made is that we need to be careful calling interstitial ectopics corneal ectopics because corneal ectopics have another meaning as already uh, described. The other point about the sites um, that are non-tubal is the point where uh, we have an ectopic that has uh, implanted in the ovary. So this is called an ovarian ectopic. Um, then we have an abdominal ectopic, we have a cervical ectopic. An ectopic can implant in a previous caesarean section scar, and that scar starts bleeding. 
uh, we can have an intramural ectopic where uh, the pregnancy is right in the muscle of the uterus. It's not residing in the decidua. It's residing right in the, in the muscle of the uterus. So that is uh, called an intramural ectopic. What we need to remember as well on ovarian ectopics is that um, there's a way to make that diagnosis and you use what is called the Spielberg criteria to make a diagnosis of um, ovarian ectopic. So it means that for you to make that diagnosis of ovarian ectopic, the tube on the same side um, as the ovarian ectopic should be completely normal. Uh, the ovary should have a ligament attached to the uterus and um, we should also have some tissue around the ovary or around the conceptus that is ovarian um, uh, tissue in origin. So those are some of the um, uh, criteria that you use uh, to decide that um, this is an ovarian ectopic. Of course, uh, the pregnancy should also be in the same location as where the ovary is supposed to be. So then you can make a diagnosis of um, ovarian ectopic. So the key investigation really in the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy is, is the pregnancy test. Uh, because our patients really come quite late with um, severe abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, they are pale, they are in shock. And what we really need uh, most of the time is a pregnancy test. Once the pregnancy test is positive, uh, we say that the patient has an ectopic pregnancy and we start uh, preparing the patient uh, for theater. An abdominal ultrasound um, is, um, is really something that we do for, uh, for the stable patient with abdominal pain and we are suspecting an ectopic. And once you have a positive pregnancy test and you have... Um, an empty uh, endometrial cavity, um, then uh, we make a diagnosis of um, ectopic pregnancy. So abdominal ultrasound is very useful in um, uh, situations where the patient is stable and uh, the diagnosis is, is not in uh, the diagnosis is in question. Then abdominal ultrasound uh, really comes in handy. We don't want patients in shock going for ultrasound uh, because uh, then we are delaying the management when uh, the diagnosis is really obvious. Um, the other investigation that um, is done in other settings that we don't normally do is a serum beta HCG. Again, the serum beta HCG is only useful in um, in situations where we want to do a conservative management or an expectant management. And again, in our setup, these uh, situations are quite rare. The patients that we need to do conservative management or is it expectant management or medical management are very, very few because of the kind of patients we have. So that is not normally done. Um, paracentesis and chordocentesis are not really um, investigations per se, but it's something that there are procedures that we do um, uh, to to kind of confirm a diagnosis. But they're only being mentioned here to be uh, to be discouraged. That um, in the modern era, really, um, with availability of ultrasound and our um, diagnostic skills, our examination skills uh, should be able to pick up uh, blood in the abdomen and so on. So there's no need to start pricking the patient in the abdomen with a needle or a cannula uh, causing pain when we can use um, examination skills to pick up uh, fluid in the abdomen. If the patient, if the diagnosis is in question, then it's really just better to do an ultrasound scan instead of pricking um, uh, the patient's abdomen or doing a chordocentesis in this case. So uh, these procedures are really uh, being mentioned just to be discouraged. And um, unless we are really, really pushed against the wall, then we can do uh, these uh, procedures. 
So what do we do after we've made um, a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy? Of course, we need to explain to the patient uh, the diagnosis that we've uh, found. We need to get consent uh, for surgery. We need to make sure we resuscitate the patient. We have some IV lines, we start running uh, fluids. Uh, we need to make sure that we uh, get the blood group for the patient. We cross match uh, the patient. Uh, we need to make sure that we do a full blood count. And in a full blood count, we are really looking out for that um, hemoglobin level because this, uh, most of these patients that we have have been bleeding by the time they get uh, uh, to the hospital. We need to inform the theater. We need to inform blood bank about the state of the patient because in our setup, again, blood is really hard to find. So you need to inform uh, your blood bank in time. Then uh, we need to take the patient to theater. Normally we do... Uh, we do a laparotomy. Um, the important thing about the surgery is that we do um, a salpingectomy. A salpingectomy is advised, uh, that is removing the tube that is having the ectopic pregnancy when the contralateral tube is normal. So the other tube is normal. What is advised is to do a salpingectomy on the side where uh, the the ectopic uh, pregnancies. Otherwise, we just risk the patient um, having another ectopic on the same side that, that we removed the, um, uh, the ectopic. If the um, tube on the other side is abnormal, maybe uh, there's some room for some uh, conservative surgery in, in that case. Um, Laparoscopic surgery is uh, rarely done in our setup. It's really almost non-existent it's unless the patient has money and then they can go in those private facilities when they can, where they can have this minimally uh, invasive surgery. Medical management as well is rarely done. Uh, the reasons um, that our patients are really hard to reach, they are difficult to follow up, um, uh, beta HCG levels uh, are difficult to do for most patients and uh, most of all our patients come late and they really don't qualify for, uh, for medical uh, management. So what, what do we do after the surgery? Uh, we need to explain what was done and why it was done. Did we do a salpingostomy? Did we do a salpingectomy? Was it a total salpingectomy? Was it a partial salpingectomy? So we need to explain um, all those things. Where was the, ex uh, the ectopic itself? Um, what was the state of the other tube? We need to explain to the patient are they likely to get uh, pregnant in the other in the next uh, the next time? How easy is it that they'll become pregnant in the next time? How uh, what's the possibility that uh, an ectopic pregnancy will happen again? Um, we also need to tell these patients that um, when they miss a period, when they become pregnant, they immediately need to come uh, back to the facility because the risk of ectopic pregnancy is higher in somebody who already had an ectopic. So we need to rule out the fact that there's an ectopic immediately that they miss their periods. We also need to explain, of course, the um, uh, danger signs uh, for these uh, patients before discharge. So they need to come back if they have any severe abdominal pain, they need to come back if they have a, a fever, they need to come back if they have uh, some um, abnormal uh, vaginal uh, discharge or excessive uh, vaginal bleeding. Uh, so thank you so much for listening and we will see you in the next uh, presentation when we talk about specific management of specific uh, types of ectopic uh, pregnancy.